उत्तर प्रदेश के औरैया जिले में पंद्रह वर्षीय दलित स्कूली छात्र की कथित तौर पर शिक्षक की पिटाई से मौत के बाद भड़की हिंसा के मामले में अब तक नौ लोगों को गिरफ्तार कर लिया गया है पुलिस ने यह जानकारी दी है पुलिस ने हिंसा के लिए जिम्मेदार पैंतीस नामजद और ढाई सौ अज्ञात लोगों में से नौ लोगों को गिरफ्तार किया है और अय्या के पुलिस अधीक्षक चारू निगम ने कहा उछलदा पुलिस स्टेशन में मामला दर्ज किया गया है हमने सड़क पर छात्र के शव के साथ विरोध करने और सरकारी वाहनों को जलाने और नुकसान पहुंचाने के आरोप में नौ लोगों को गिरफ्तार किया है पूरे प्रकरण में नियमानुसार समीचीन धाराओं में अभियोग पंजीकृत किया गया है क्योंकि शव को रख के शोरगुल करना ये बिल्कुल भी नियमानुसार नहीं है और रास्ता रोकना बिल्कुल विधिक नहीं है इसमें समीचीन कार्रवाई की जा रही है 35 जो लोग वहाँ पे सीसीटीवी से और जो वीडियो रिकॉर्डिंग से उनसे चिन्हित किए गए हैं उनके विरुद्ध नामजद एवं दो ढाई अज्ञात लोगों के विरुद्ध अभियोग पंजीकृत किया गया है हालांकि छात्र को पीटने का आरोपी शिक्षक अभी भी फरार है जिला प्रशासन के अधिकारियों द्वारा पर्याप्त मुआवजे और आरोपियों के खिलाफ सख्त कार्रवाई का आश्वासन दिए जाने के बाद परिजनों ने मंगलवार को शव का अंतिम संस्कार किया गौरतलब हो कि छात्र निकित का शव गांव में पहुंचने के बाद हिंसक विरोध हुआ था मृत लड़के के परिवार के नेतृत्व में स्थानीय निवासियों ने उसके शव को सड़क पर रखकर बड़े पैमाने पर विरोध प्रदर्शन किया था सुप्रीम कोर्ट से उद्धव ठाकरे को बड़ा झटका लगा है कोर्ट ने उद्धव ठाकरे गुट की अर्जी को खारिज करते हुए तय करने का फैसला चुनाव आयोग को दे दिया कि असली शिवसेना किसकी है बेंच ने एक नाथ शिंदे की शिवसेना को असली शिवसेना माना जाए ये तय करने के चुनाव आयोग को रोकने की मांग वाली उद्धव ठाकरे गुट की अर्जी को खारिज कर दिया दरअसल सुप्रीम कोर्ट की संविधान पीठ ने भारत के चुनाव आयोग को एक शिंदे समूह के असली शिवसेना के दावे का फैसला करने से रोकने से इनकार कर दिया एक दिन की सुनवाई के बाद उद्धव ठाकरे गुट द्वारा दायर स्टे की अर्जी को खारिज कर दिया सुप्रीम कोर्ट ने भारत के चुनाव आयोग को यह तय करने की अनुमति दे दी है कि उद्धव ठाकरे और एक शिंदे के बीच किस गुट को असली शिवसेना पार्टी के रूप में मान्यता दी जाए और धनुष और तीर का चिन्ह आवंटित किया जाए दरअसल सुप्रीम कोर्ट ने शिंदे समूह के असली शिवसेना के रूप में मान्यता के दावे पर भारत के चुनाव आयोग के समकक्ष कार्रवाई पर रोक लगाने से इनकार कर दिया कोर्ट ने चुनाव आयोग के समक्ष कार्रवाई पर रोक लगाने की उद्धव ठाकरे समूह की याचिका को खारिज कर दिया वहीं दूसरी तरफ एक शिंदे गुट ने चुनाव आयोग को चिट्ठी लिखी है और सुप्रीम कोर्ट का हवाला दिया है गुट ने चुनाव आयोग से फैसला लेने को कहा है गौरतलब है कि महाविकास अगाड़ी सरकार में मंत्री रहे शिवसेना के एक नाथ शिंदे ने शिवसेना विधायकों के एक गुट को तोड़ लिया था और बीजेपी के साथ मिलकर सरकार बना ली थी इसके बाद से असली शिवसेना किसकी है इसको लेकर मामला चुनाव आयोग और कोर्ट का चक्कर लगा रहा है so um you know i think a novel probably has a number of starting points and there's a moment where several things need to come together um so i had for a long time i'd been interested in just the idea of childhood friendships um right. and the way they're quite different to to other friendships i mean you know the friends we, if i look at the friends i've made in my sort of post university days yeah. they tend to be yeah. people who are So roughly doing the same kind of thing I'm doing. They're writers, they're journalists, they're academics. Um, broadly, have the same kind of political views. You know, live similar lives, kind of thing. If I look at my childhood friends, they're doing all kinds of things. You know, they might be working in uh, as a banker. They might be working as doctors or running a business. Um, their their views on the world will be quite different from mine. But we've always been friends. And so, even though we know that if we met today for the first time. we might not be very interested in each other uh, we might even dislike each other but that friendship is is very strong and i i was known for a while that i wanted to write a novel that had friendship squarely at its center mm-hmm. uh then 2016 came along yeah which yeah. was you know in britain there was brexit in america there was trump right and i started to hear a lot of people same things like oh you know there are all these relationships that are falling apart now there's this person who believes you know who's on the other side of the argument and i can't talk to them anymore and i get so angry and um and i found myself thinking about you know what a friendship can survive what it can't or what happens when for years you've been different and it's been fine you just ignore the points of difference you know you concentrate on your commonality uh, but what happens if that source of difference you can't ignore it anymore 
and it demands that friendship contend with it. So it sort of started in that way, which I suppose was more sort of abstract in some way. Um, and then I was writing an article about the Pakistan women's cricket team. Okay. And the article started in the winter of 1988, which was, in, you know, a sort of starting moment for Pakistan women's cricket. And it started, you know, in the sort of around the time of Benazir coming to power in Pakistan. Yeah. And as I was writing it, um, I felt this sort of tingling in my fingers. Mm -hmm. yeah, I was only writing two paragraphs for an essay you know, to right. sort of lead in. And I thought and I just found that there was such strong memories and emotions attached to it. And I thought how weird that. I never, I've never written about that in fiction, mm -hmm. um, although it was such a crucial point. And because I had in mind this idea of the childhood friendship, and I just thought, oh, that's where it's going to begin, is right. 1988 in Karachi, around the time Bain Azir is coming to power. Um, so I suppose all those things came together to, to create that idea of okay. what it would be and where it would be and when it would be. Yes. And uh, while I was reading it, I was wondering, so the characters, the personalities, are they derived from real people, not just in this novel, but even mm. in your earlier works? And how much do you derive from the real? So, you know, it's an odd thing, but when the thing I'm least interested in with my novels is, mm. is do the, who else you know, who in my actual life shares traits with these characters, because once I start creating them, to me, they become themselves, right. if that makes sense. It's very hard mm -hmm. to see them, you know, and I'm sure I could sort of sit and say, well, you know, this characteristic Mariam has in common with me and that characteristic mm -hmm. Zara does, and this maybe Mariam, you know, shares with someone I know. Mm -hmm. um, and somewhere in the back of my brain, of course, I'm using, you know, my life experience and the people I've met and the person I am. Mm -hmm. um, but, but they aren't specifically based on any one person each. They mm. probably have a lot of different characteristics. And, and you know, the, I know there are people for whom the joy of writing or, or what they write for is to take the world as they see it or real mm. characters they know and, and somewhat fictionalize them. Mm. Uh, but for me, it's, it's like I'm in some ways, I'm still that child who just wants to make things up. Uh, so the making up is always the fun. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you've been wanting to write ever since you were 11, I think. And uh, you've grown up in a home, you know, mm -hmm. where there were writers, academics. So how much did that affect you? I think probably a lot. I mean, you know, if you read Broke, uh, um, Best of Friends, you'll see yeah. in it that, that both the girls are really, you know, the, the, family, the families they have are so important to the characters they become. Right. Um, I grew up in, in a place, in, in a house, in a family where people were always reading, they were writing, they were talking about books. And, and so it always felt to me perfectly natural that I would be a voracious reader and that, you know, I'd sit and start writing. And of course, it was only much later you realize it's most of my friends weren't doing that at all. And, and most of my friends didn't come from families where people were talking about books at the time. But it just meant that to me, it was just, you know, Books were as much part of life as, mm. as food was. Right. In some way. Right. Um, and when I, th I think when you learn that very early on, it just stays mm. with you. So, you know, but of course, the, sorry, the other, the other thing, yeah. I mean, of course, is now, you know, we're very lucky. There are a lot of writers coming out of Pakistan. And I think if you're mm. a young Pakistani now, it's, you know, writing is one of the things you might want to do with your life. Right. Um, but when I was growing up, and particularly because for me, you know, my language, the language I was reading was English. Mm. And there weren't a lot of English language writers around. There was Babsi Sitwa was sort of the one who, you know, we knew, but she almost seemed like the one exception. When there's only one, you think that's the exception. Mm. Um, and she was the only one I was aware of, though later mm. I learned there were others. So the, the, just the fact that I had a mother who used to sit at a desk mm. and write sentences, mm. you know, I think that, that made me think this is a way you can be and this is a thing you can do with your life, which I otherwise probably wouldn't have. Right. You know, I've always wondered in the past 20 years, you know, even mm -hmm. my reading, uh, contemporary Pakistani writers writing in English have been doing mm -hmm. exceptionally well across the world mm -hmm. and especially in India. You know, we're really waiting to kind of book the books on Amazon before. Yeah. So what do you think are the reasons for that? Um, I mean, I think 
I think there's a very specific thing, which is the importance of uh, Indian publishing for Pakistani writers, mm -hmm. um, which is there are a lot of writers who aren't getting published in the UK or, or America and, and have historically, say, the last 10 or 15 years been published in India. You know, mm -hmm. the first, I know it's sort of about um, 10 years ago, it became quite fashionable for everyone to say, oh, Pakistani writing is you know, yeah. the exciting new thing. But the first person who said to me, you know, Pakistani writing is what we're really looking for was an Indian publisher. Mm -hmm. And I think that was, a, you know, and it makes sense, of course, because we are these countries which mm -hmm. are tied to each other in all kinds of ways and yet remain, because it's so hard to, to get mm. across the border, mm. we don't know each other as well. Mm. And and novels became one way mm. to know each other. Um, and so, of course, I think I think there's, now that it's harder, you know, books aren't getting across from India to Pakistan, it's all getting harder. I think that's really, really problematic for Pakistani writing. Mm. Um, so I think a lot of the, the the interest and and the the sort of infrastructure got created from Indian publishing, okay. uh, which I think was very very significant. Even someone like Uzma Asim Khan, really wonderful writer, mm. her first publication was in India, right. um, and um, I think what also ha happens is once a few people start doing it, mm. it becomes possible. So I, I won't say that 30 years ago, Pakistanis weren't capable of writing novels right. in that way. Right. Um, but I think it just became more possible, you know, some writers were doing it, other people said, well, why, mm. well I can write better than that, or I mm. want to write like that, or I want to write my own version of it. Um, of course, in the Zia years also, with all that censorship, it was harder mm. to, to write. So there was that posting. But having said that, I mean, if you look in the last few years, I think you'll find that the the world beyond South Asia has, I mean, there was a moment post 9-11 where it was, oh, we want to know about this place because it's in the news. Yeah. You know, so there was some of that going on. That has gone, um, yeah. which is why, you know, you're, you know, there was sort of then this sort of lull for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, I mean, this year you've got two really exciting novelists, Temur Sumro and Amina Ahmed, mm -hmm. um, who've got wonderful books coming out. So I hope it's a thing where, you know, once it gets going, yeah, and also interestingly, uh, you know, not just those writing in English, somebody like Ali Akbar Natik, you know, mm -hmm. they are also getting translated and yeah. the books are doing so well in India. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, it, it makes sense, you know, it just makes sense mm -hmm. that that places that have certain, you, know, they, you understand certain subtexts, yeah. um, you're just going to understand and have a greater appreciation for the novels or the poems or the short stories. Hmm. Hmm. And how was your process of researching ISIS propaganda for home fire? Hmm. I mean, were you a little apprehensive going on the web and doing all the research? Oh, I was totally apprehensive. I mean, the phrase Googling <laughs> while Muslim that appears in the book very yeah, much came out of my yeah, own, own sense that's of apprehension. Nice. Um, hmm. And it was it was sort of starting to realize and it's sort of one of the things that that in I don't know how far you are in, but with the second half of the best of friends, you mm. you have a point where Zara in particular is so aware of a sort of surveillance state she's living mm. in in Britain. Mm. Um, and it's something I became very conscious of with Home Fires is I found I was genuinely worried mm. about, you know, as a Muslim who had just become a British citizen to mm. go online and look up ISIS propaganda, that half my brain was saying, don't be ridiculous, you're a novelist. Right. You know, and the other half of my brain was saying, what if someone knocks on my door? Yeah. Um, and actually what I did was um, I got very lucky because I have a friend called Julian yeah. Slovo, who's a wonderful yeah. writer, and she was working on a play at the time okay. about ISIS recruitment. Right. And she was very wonderful because she you was sort of sending me in the direction of, you know, certain yeah. places and, and give me certain kinds of information. So I didn't really have to go and Google ISIS recruitment London, <laughs> which I was uh, sort of worried about doing. Right. But also, I mean, the other thing was, I knew that there was a lot of violent, violent propaganda out there, which I mm. myself didn't want to look at. I didn't want, you know, I knew that they put the images out to try and get into your head and, and mm. I didn't want that. So I wanted to avoid mm. Mm. that. But, but fortunately, there are a lot of journalists in the world who do the hard work for me. So I just mm. have to go and see what they've written about it. You know, your initial books, I think four of them were set in Karachi. Mm. So. Uh, how was the experience going away from home in your work? It was a surprise. You know, burnt shadows when I started to think of it. 
yeah. was going to be a novel set in Karachi, but there was a character whose grandmother was Japanese and had lived through the bombing. Hmm. But it was really going to be sort of Karachi, summer of 98, when Pakistan tested its nuclear bombs. I mean, that was where it started. Hmm. And then I found myself just thinking, but who is this grandmother who lived through the bombing of Nagasaki? And, hmm. and because as a writer, I don't really plan things. I just sort of follow my curiosity. My curiosity led me to her. Mm-hmm. And and I discovered, found that then I was writing you know, mm-hmm. this book that's starting in, in Nagasaki. And, and once it was like something in my brain shifted that I had, I had always convinced myself that I could only write about Karachi. And as soon as I started, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. I, I realized, no, actually, there are different ways. You can write from a position of intimacy and knowing, yeah. but then you can write from a position of discovery. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was terrifying. Mm-hmm. And it was also thrilling. And I think it's why the sort of, you know, the three books after were barely sort of, yeah. you know, I mean, they have bits of Karachi in them, but mm. sort of went all over the place. Mm. Um, and then this was a sort of, this one is me thinking, well, let's, let's go back and mm. spend a little more time in Karachi again. Right. Now, mm. you've been based in England for quite a while. So mm. does the distance mm. give you a better perspective when writing about Karachi, when writing about Pakistan or the subcontinent? You know, I, I don't really subscribe to that because I think if I were to write about, from this distance, if I were to write about Karachi to 2022, right. I don't think I'm in a better position than, say, Muhammad Hanif, who's sitting in Karachi. He yes. clearly knows much more because he's immersed in it every day. Right. Uh, I mean, and again, that's just what the writer I am. Someone like, you know, James Joyce wrote Ulysses while sitting in Paris. So hmm. clearly it can be done. Yeah. Um, but my, my feeling is actually it, that time does something interesting. So I can now look back at Karachi 1988 mm. in a way that even sort of in 2000, I wasn't able to. Um, yeah. you know, so I, I think that the, dis- the interesting distance is one that comes with, with time mm. rather than with a sort of physical moving away. Okay. Okay. And, uh, you know, your mentor, Aga Shahid Ali, mm. I'd in fact gone to his house in Kashmir to meet Hina. The wow. sister, yes, yes. yes. And uh, what are some of the things that uh, will never leave you about Magar Shahid Ali? Oh, many things. You know, I think about Shahid so much, um, mm. all the time. Uh, it's it's when he died. It's a friend once said it's like there's a little internalized version of him who sits inside you, and every now and then yeah. will will sort of you know either tell you that you are. Because Koshai had these two much, so either will tell you that you've written a terrible sentence, you just need to delete it mm. and mm. erase it from your memory. And then there's that other version of Shahid who's, who's just making you laugh or yeah. reminding you to not take yourself mm. so seriously. Mm. Um, he was, he was sad. And again, because I met him when I was 18, I didn't realize how rare a combination he was of someone who was so serious, mm. you know, about the writing and wouldn't give an inch. Mm. Um, but also knew, you know, that, that it's sort of a cliche, don't sweat the small stuff. Mm. Um, but Shahid really knew how to just treat things in perspective, you know, don't get hung up on your ego. Don't get up, hung up on small slights or, mm. uh, the little things and enjoy, I mean, his enjoyment of the good things in life, you know, to enjoy what you have, um, mm. you know, and also you know, the things that you feel passionately strongly mm. about and you're going to write about them you you mm. do that with absolute seriousness and mm. commitment and don't cheat mm. Mm. why do you write prose but uh, uh, you know you must have written poetry in your creative writing mm. masters and you must have learned it so did that also help you and was Arash mm. Aydali's influence as a poet on you so I knew I knew Shahid both as an undergraduate and you know so yeah. when I was an undergraduate I went to Hamilton he was teaching there and then my masters I went to UMass because Shahid was there largely mm-hmm. um, and for my masters I didn't do any poetry but I did as an undergrad I took a couple of poetry classes with him mm-hmm. um, it made a huge difference it sort of freed up my prose I think in some way um, yeah. and also it you know that idea of having really paying attention to every word. Mm. And the thing that I learned from Shahid, which I still do, was to read out loud, because he always used to say that the ear will catch things that the eye doesn't. Mm. Um, okay. And so I still, and it's as true for, for prose as it is for poetry. Right, right. Mm. And what is your process? I'd love to know that. 
My process is, um, I start very slowly, you know, mm -hmm. there comes a point when I haven't been writing for a while and then I'm just, and I know there's some, some kind of inkling of an idea and, and then I think, well, I need to start thinking about a little more. And then months go by, you know, in which something very slight forms. Mm. Um, and then I sit down, I manage to get a first page, and then I just stop and I'm stuck for a long time. So the beginnings really are slow because I have no idea where I'm going, what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, and it really is important at that point for me to be quite disciplined. So, you know, when I decide I'm really doing this, then five days a week, okay. you know, in the morning, I sit at my desk. Okay. How long I stay at my desk? is up for grabs, you know, it might just be some days you just think it's, it's not happening, it's an hour, two hours, some days it's much longer. Uh, the deeper I get into a novel, the more, you know, the, so the more it flows. Um, right. So then, you know, the, for much of it, it's sort of I'm sitting at my desk for, you know, a four or five hour stretch, I might write from sort of, I'm not a very early riser, but let's say, I, 9 30 to 2 30 and write mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. i have a very late lunch and then i'm done with writing for the day right. um and i do that five days a week as though you know mm -hmm. it were a success okay. job any other kind of and what do you do between novels um between novels i always plan to do huge amounts of reading and somehow that never happens one of the things that happens between novels is while i'm writing a novel People ask me to do things and I say, I'm writing a novel, ask me after. <laughs> so, for instance, the last couple of months, I've done a couple of lectures, a mm. couple of essays. I've got a short story I've been commissioned to write, done okay. a couple of th things for the BBC. So there are always a little bits of things. But also I was in Istanbul last month with my sister for a few days. So, you know, okay. you get to do a little bit of traveling. Short story is new. I mean, uh, you've never written short stories before, if I'm correct. No, I have written many short stories. It's just okay. short stories are not very good. <laughs> so you don't know about them. Um, I, I, I've always written short stories, but they tend to be on commission. So it'll be, there'll be okay. an anthology and it'll have a short story by yeah. me somewhere. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's, a, it's a, such a complicated form mm. that maybe one out of three, I'll feel, okay, that really does work as a short story. And the rest, I think, well, it's a novelist trying to write a short story. Yeah. yeah. Subscribe now and press the bell icon, never miss an update.